thank you for watching. Today I'm talking with Cortez Randolph, who is based in Alabama, USA, and he is a gunshot survivor, was left paralyzed after a gunshot, um, but he is now an inspirational speaker and founder of the Walk With Me ministry. And Cortez has really turned his life around and is now helping a lot of people. And today we decided to film this interview today, uh, which is May 31st when this was filmed, because that is the um, seven year anniversary of the shooting. So it's, you know, it's a very important day for Cortez. Uh, and that's why we picked a day to, to tell his story, basically. And that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be talking about his incredible story and all of the odds that he's overcome uh, to get where he is in life. So Cortez, thank you for taking the time to have a talk with me today. Thank you very much. Gotcha. Hey, uh, if a lot of people don't know me, my name is Cortez Randolph. I was born in the state of Alabama in the U.S. I am 36 years of age. I, um, you know, been through life, growing up in life, I faced, you know, different obstacles as being um, the youngest sibling of my family um, out of two boys that my mother had. Um, grew up, I grew up in poverty. Um, grew up, I seeing my mother, you know, get abused and you know, things like that. And, you know, seeing my mother on drugs, not having a father. Don't, you know, I don't want to blame no one or, or take the blame, but I, I had less guidance. I didn't have much guidance as the rest of the kids, like going to school and in the neighborhood. So I took it upon myself to really guide myself and, and watch, you know, the community and see what, you know, what's going on that I can catch on to. So, you know, growing up in the community that I grew up in, um, we had no choice but to um, grow up around drugs and a lot of gun violence and stuff like that because we grew up in a uh, in a in a gated community where it's a lot of violence going on. And I say that to say this: um, I, I was I was easily influenced, and and growing up, um, I started stealing to try to support my habits um, that I had picked up. I had picked up a marijuana habit at the age of thirteen. Um, so me trying to support that and, um, trying to get me stuff to wear for school to try to keep up with the other kids. I was only finding myself in deeper trouble. Um, as I got caught stealing, I was, uh, in and out of juvenile detention center, um, up to 20 times. And I ended up going to the juvenile facility, uh, up until I got 15 and then, you know, on, on going and on gun. But, um, I, I say that to say this, I come to a point in life. Um, at the age of 15, where I was doing so much, I knew something was going to eventually happen to me. And um, being in a, in, a, in a neighborhood gang, uh, one day a couple of my friends uh, had got into it with a guy. And the guy came back for retaliation. Me not having nothing to do with it, I you know, was at the wrong spot at the wrong time. I ended up at the age of 16, getting shot in the hand. And I didn't take it lightly. I took it too hard, but I didn't take it lightly because I felt like growing up, getting shot, going to jail, that that only made you rough or made you tougher than you know the other kids. So I brushed that off. Uh, at the age of 17, I ended up going to prison you know, for something that I didn't do other community, but that's just to make up for the things that I did do. So I take all that, I took all that in and just to say that, uh, you know, I've I done a lot of stuff in life that I'm not proud of, but I had to suffer the consequences of some of the stuff that I didn't do. And um, at the age of 17, I ended up getting out of prison. I went back to prison at the age of 18. I got out when I was like 26. And just my, my life was just on and on and on and just, to a point where I wanted to just, you know, just give up. But I felt like deep down inside that my life was more, and I can see a bigger picture that my life was more important than this. So as I get out of prison at the age of 27, I met this older woman. And I didn't have, I didn't know nothing about no job. I didn't know how to fill out an application. I didn't really even know how to do nothing. By me being locked up all of my adolescent years and all my teen years, I wasn't taught. And then I, I missed school. I didn't graduate. I got kicked out of school in sixth grade. So I did, everything that I know has come from, you know, the community. And that's not much. So um, by me getting out of 2010 of prison, 
Oh, and that was my last fall of being incarcerated. So I met this older woman, like I was saying, and we, you know, she she took on the like with me. She showed me how to, you know, write applications. She showed me how to get jobs. She showed me how to do a lot that I didn't know myself. And and by her showing me how to do that, I became the man that I was supposed to be. I ended up having a son in 2005. And when I got out 2010, um, he was five years old. So I left him at a day old and got out when he was five. So me seeing him growing up like that, this really what took the cake to me saying, okay, I want to change my life. You know, because I got to see this coming up and he's looking behind, he's looking after me. So I got to do what's right. So me seeing him and, you know, just got tired of the in and out and by me getting older and I had to take, I couldn't, I couldn't blame my, I couldn't blame my mother no more. I couldn't blame my father no more. I couldn't blame nobody. I had to, I'm at an age now where I had to take upon myself and just say, hey, I got to lock in, man. I got to get my mind together, you know, because I'm getting old and I got a son to look after. But, um, yeah, uh, me, and, me and the older woman, we end up kicking it off. And, you know, she showed me 2012, she showed me my way back to God. You know, I, I'm not spiritual. I had, not, I had always been spiritual. But uh, my grandma, she used to take me in and out of church. And I know, you know, to be on this earth, that is a God. And, and I, you know, I just said, okay, I done tried everything in the book. So let me try, you know, to change my life. So 2012, I ended up going to church and I gave my life to God. Not saying that everything was going to be perfect. It seemed like when I did that, that's when the ball started, you know, everything started going downhill. You know, I end up, um, man, it was just, you know, going through a bad relationship. Uh, my, my mother, my mother, you know, she's, her, her addiction got stronger. My brother was in and out of prison. Um, just a lot, man. I ended up, you know, having a, well, we had another child on the way. And, you know, I lost one job. So uh, by me having one foot in and one, I had one foot in the church serving God and I had the other foot, you know, want to do, you know, the things of the world because that's what I was accustomed to. You know, that's what my baby, that's what, that was my pacifier. If something happened to me when I'm trying to do good, then I'll turn back to the screen, you know, to the world and try to, you know, pacify with that. But it would never work because it was something on the inside of me saying, this ain't me. You know, I want to do better. So, uh, 2013, I end up, I, I got another job and, you know, I was settled. I was setting in because I had been out two years. So now I'm like, okay, I can, you know, get myself together. So I ended up getting another job, man, and had my little boy at the age of, uh, yeah, he was 13 at two, uh, well, he was a year old in 2013. And 2014 was the crash of the year. You know, I, I never expected this to come. And this what this what changed my life tremendous. This what made me just say, hey, I you know, I give up. And not saying it in a bad way, but I just, you know, got tired of the streets and living in the world. Well, I said, okay, God, here I am. And um 2014, man, that was it was a good year, but it was a bad year. Um uh, I ended up uh May the 31st, 2014. I woke up one morning. Not expecting nothing. I didn't feel no type of, you know, difference or nothing like that. I just, you know, took use the day. I was end up going to work. Um, I had to go to work that day, and I woke up like about nine o'clock that morning. So me and my, um, me and my spouse, we was on, you know, we was on bad terms. So you know, I'm trying to talk to her and you know get back in the house because that's my comfort zone. It felt like when I was out of there, I didn't have nothing to turn to. So. We end up um, talking, and she had to go to a funeral that morning. So I was like, well, can I come back home? She said, we'll talk after the funeral. She said, you can come with me to the funeral or just wait till I get off. So I said, okay, I'm going to wait till you finish the funeral, and I will, you know, see you after. So I said, I'm going to go get me and my son a haircut, you know, do my normal Saturday and, and routine while I'm off. So I said, okay, I went and got my oldest son. We went and got, you know, we sat in the barbershop and I went outside while he was in the barbershop. I went outside to use the phone and a guy that uh, was in tour with my brother, you know, me and I, I didn't have no type of, you know, beef with him or no type of stuff like that. So I asked him, I said, hey, man, uh, 
you know, what you, you know, I don't got nothing to do with you and my brother, but just, you know, won't y'all, you know, sell it down because I always trying to be the peace, the peacemaker. I said, won't y'all just, you know, calm down, man. And by the time I said that, he just flipped on me like, man, you know, cussing me out and, you know, calling me out my name. So stuff like that. So I said, okay, I'm not going, you know, start nothing up with him. And long story short, not knowing that he was, he left. Me not having a you know, second thought that he was going to come back because I, went even, I, went, I didn't have no beef with him. So after he came back, you know, I didn't expect, you know, him to have no gun or nothing. So um, when he pulled back up, he, he held his arm out the window. So me, you know, by him having his arm out the window, I tried to ease in the barbershop. So when I tried to go in the barbershop, my son was coming out. And it really jammed me up to go inside the door. So when he coming out, I'm trying to go in. And that's when the guy thought I tried to run or something, in which I was trying to get away. But I didn't want to show just no quick fear because, you know, he could have unloaded and, you know, killed me. So he shot one time. And um, that, for that first shot, it hit me in my chest and took me to the ground in front of my son. So it made me feel like I was less than a hero to be shot in front of my son like that and to see him dramatically over just crying and just boohooing, man, and me not, you know, I'm conscious, but I can't move. You know, I knew it was something bigger than me on the ground that I couldn't move. So I, I you know, I prayed and I asked, I asked, you know, God to please don't let me die. And I told my son to go in and get the, you know, the barber or whatnot, and he went in and I, he came out and I asked him, his name was Tyrone. I said, Tyrone, please, man. I said, don't let me die. He said, you ain't going nowhere. And, and I, he told me that, you know, I felt relief. You know, I didn't panic. I always, you know, watch movies and by me, you know, being, you know, having my first gunshot, they always told me don't panic because if you panic, you can either, you know, have a heart attack, you know, it, it, can, it can cause you to, you know, have bigger, bigger things. So I just, you know, was calm and I still was conscious through it all. I ended up going to Huntsville, Alabama hospital and after I got there, like I said, I talked to God one more time. And, you know, I knew I was in some serious injuries because I went bleeding on the outside. You know, and I asked God, I said, God, please don't let me die. He said, I got you. And that was his last word. And after that, I went up on the surgery. You know, I went up on anesthesia and, and, and things like that. So, man, it's, 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 the, it's the part that what really got me is I woke up two days later in the hospital. And I ended up pulling my... Um, pulling my the screen out of my throat on life support because I was I was curious like you know I was I was delusional like where I'm at and what's going on but I end up you know I pulled you know the tube out of whatnot and that caused the the head nurse the head doctor to come in and he told the nurses because they ran in because it set off alarm and he ran in he said well just leave me here let him calm down he said I'll be back with you in a minute so when he came back in. You know, I felt something in my spirit that what you know, it wasn't adding up. And I really wanted to know. You know, it was just me and the doctor. My family couldn't come in because I was in ICU. And he told me, he said, hey, he said, I got some good news and I got some bad news, man. What do you want to hear? I said, it don't even matter. He said, the good news is you're still alive. I said, thank you, God. You know, he was like, the bad news is you ain't going to be able to walk again. So I looked at him. I said, man, it don't even matter. As long as I'm alive, you know. Because it's, it's a chance that I'll walk again. I got faith and I believe. And um, he was like, man, he was like, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. So I what you mean by that? He said, you got to be doing something that God wants you to do. Because we gave up on you. He said, we did all we can do. So, you know, that was another, that was another thing that really keep me going. Like, I can look at all my, over my life, like, man, I just had so much bad stuff happening to me in my life. But I always try to take the bad things and flip it around for my good because if I sit around and if I keep complaining about, you know, all the bad things, then I won't be able to be, you know, a good person. So I sit in the hospital, I beat myself up. And this is why I found the ministry. This is why I found the calling. I sit in the hospital, I beat myself up a little bit. And I asked God, I said, why? Why you leave me alive? And, you know, and... He didn't, he didn't never, he didn't tell me right then. And, you know, I went to church when I got out of the hospital and he gave me the word. He said, I left you alive to make people believe 
make the doubters believe that I am God, that I am real. And he said, for you to save your family. So um, I said, okay, I understand that. And uh, he was like, I need you to name a ministry. And I asked people, because I didn't know, you know, I didn't know nothing about no ministry or really didn't even know nothing about, you know, God for real. So as I, you know, studied my spiritual mother and spiritual father, they, they told me, they was like, yeah, you know, the life trauma you've been through, you got a ministry. And what a ministry is, is, you know, to, to gather, you know, your people or to gather people up that's like-minded like you and to walk and to, you know, do the, do the will of God. So I said, okay. And they told me to go back and read because I got shot at 30 and Jesus started his ministry at 30, you know? So I'm like, okay, now I see, you know, it's adding up. So they, I went back and I read and he was like, it was just like, just, you know, kicking gear and go tell the non-believers that, you know, I'm real. And just to show them through your life that I'm real. So that's, you know, I just thank God, man. I go throughout the schools. I go throughout the, you know, different detention centers, man. I'm so inspired by the things that I do. I was so privileged on October of 2019, going into a place that I spent most of my life in like 25 times that I was labeled one of the baddest kids in there. And so by me uh, having the privilege to go back in there and speak, you know, to the people that I, I used to be around and some of the, you know, officers used to be, you know, used to tell me, man, you're going to prison or you ain't going to live long. And just to show them, even though I came back in in a wheelchair, but I'm able to come back in and pour out some of the things that I went through and the life lessons, you know, that I, I had to go through. So that's what inspired me the most. You know, even though I travel, I do things outside like that. What inspired me the most and make me happy is that I'm able to tell somebody and to help somebody through my life, you know, experience and what I've been through in life. So now, now I know, at first I used to beat myself up, but now I know my purpose and it make me more happier and more, you know, grateful to know my purpose and to know why God left me here even in this situation. So I'm just thankful, man. Incredible story, Cortez. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's absolutely amazing everything you've come through in your life and everything. And I, you know, I mean, one other thing to sort of touch on here is I know you've got some big plans in the future now. I mean, I know you've got some, you know, you've got a book coming along and you've got some, uh, obviously, more plans to speak in, you know, jail houses and you've got some, some good things sort of, uh, you know, on the horizon, as they say, um, which, is, which is the other thing I'm just putting in here just for, just for people to know, um, you know, that you've got some things, you know, really coming along. Um, I mean, that's, it's an amazing story, no matter how many times I hear it. And, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm very grateful for you telling me um, and I, you know, I really think it'll, it'll benefit people uh, and really help people a lot, you know? So thank you. Um, just want to come on to encourage someone. Um, it was on my heart. Um, a lot of us have uh, brought some things that we were supposed to let go in 2019 over with us to 2020. And um, to be honest, we're not going to move forward if we keep reaching backwards. And, and thinking just because a person's saying um, that they're going to change or they're going to do right and they show you for a certain amount of time and then when that time period run out, they continue doing the same thing and you're going to find yourself just because you reached back and, you know, and trusted them that they're going to do better, you're going to find yourself in that same circle in 2020. And before you know it, it's going to be 2021, you're going to be making the same resolution. But I say that to say this, in order to grow, you got to let go. It might not feel good at, at that time, and it's not going to feel good, but you got to get out your comfort zone to, to get to where you need to go. And sometimes, to be honest, in these days of time, and not to sound so selfish, you got to focus on you. you regardless of what, you got to focus on you, and everything else will fall in place. And the ones that truly love you, the ones that truly care, and your real true friends uh, uh, understand if you had to get to yourself and had to do what you got to do. But if not, hey, you living in a world where it's just you and God. So you're not gotta, you, don't, you don't have to please nobody. You don't have to kiss nobody but or none of that. You just got to do what you got to do and do what's best for you. But I say that, start reaching back and move forward. Because if you continue to reach back, you're going to find yourself in the same situation that you was in 2019. So I just want to encourage someone this morning to keep pushing forward. 
even though it might get hard, even though you might be lonely, even though you might be by yourself, but keep pushing. Pray. Just, just seek God and continue to push. Do not reach back because if you reach back, then you're going to find yourself going in that same circle and you're going to be depressed, stressed, and just all the above.